Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I walk through another one of our stock selection models on Validia. This time, we discuss the criteria and characteristics of the Motley Fool model, which is based on the Motley Fool Investment Guide. This is a small cap growth strategy and is perhaps one of the more stringent models we run on Validia. Since 2003, the strategy is one of the top performers, and that is something few could have predicted. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy this discussion on our interpretation of the quantitative Motley Fool small cap growth investment strategy. All right, today we're going to continue in the series of talking about um, some of the models on Validia. And what we've done over the past couple months is we've kind of pinpointed a model and we've tried to do a little bit deeper dive into um, the strategy specifically. And today we're going to talk about a model on Validia that we launched in 2003 that was sort of different than a lot of our other models, which were largely based on investment gurus. So when we launched in 03, we had strategies based on, we still run these strategies based on Peter Lynch and Benjamin Graham and um, John Neff and and, and Buffett came in December of 03, but we also launched a strategy based on um, a book by Tom and David Gardner, who are the founders of The Motley Fool. And the name of that book was The Motley Fool Investment Guide. And we'll talk about, some of the investment criteria that go into that strategy um, in a second. But I just thought as I was kind of thinking about this podcast and thinking about The Motley Fool as an organization, <clears throat> um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, they, the company's been around since 1993. Um, they were obviously very popular in the late 90s. Um, the business, I think, took a pretty hard hit like in or during the dot-com boom and bust, um, but they survived. They largely pivoted to a subscription-based business model. Um, and the fool has um, been, I think, for a number of years, like voted in terms of the small company space, and they have like, I guess, like 300 employees worldwide. So it's it's not you know a, it's not like some rinky dink operation. I mean, the company's a pretty big, you know, got a lot of people, but it's oftentimes voted one of the best places to work. So they have a really really good culture, and the Motley Fool name is actually from a Shakespeare comedy, and I have. I don't know anything about Shakespeare, but it's from a Shakespeare comedy, As You Like It. And basically, I guess it, the Motley Fool is a reference to the court jester character, which you got, you see the fool, you know, they used to wear the, those hats. But I guess it was, it was the, the character in the, in the story that could speak the truth to the Duke without having his head cut off. And so the Motley Fool is kind of founded on, you know, speaking the truth about investing and also having, I think, fun and enjoy. And, you know, one of their, I saw these guys on the, the brother, the Gardner brothers on Consuelo Mac, I think it was maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And they have, their kind of flagship newsletter has a very good long-term track record. Um, now they don't, they don't follow at all the strategy that we have uh, implemented on Validia because they're more about finding stocks with a story behind them that are growing. Um, that are sort of founder led. So they, they have these criteria that they look for to find, you know, these 10 or 20 baggers that they look for, maybe the next Netflix or something like that, where our strategy is very different. Um, but anyways, I just thought, I just thought to open it up, you know, that would be, that was kind of an interesting sort of some fun facts um, about the fool. Um, you know, Jack, one of the things that you and I uh, were talking about too, is like when we look back on this strategy, you know, bring us back to like 03 and 04, I don't think anyone would have said that the fool would have been one of the best performers. And yet, it, it, you know, it really has been of the original set of models that we run. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things with, with, with our strategy is, is like you alluded to, I mean, they're, they're known as discretionary investors. You know, nobody would associate the, the motley fool with quantitative investing. But inside of their book, there was a very stringent small cap quantitative model. Um, you know, and then that's what we extracted. And so it is, it's very different, obviously, than what they're doing in the real world. I don't know what they, you know, they're always talking about their doubles and their growth stocks. It's like, I think they call them spiffy pops or something like that when they double or something. But it's very, you know, what we're doing is very different. But, you know, our, our goal was to find strategies that we thought were sensible, that we thought would work over the long term. And so that they had a very interesting 
model within the book. And, and like you said, you know, if we, if we had to guess, um, you know, coming out of 2003, which of, I think we, we started with eight models on Validity. If we had to guess which of the eight models, you know, when you had names like Buffett and Graham and people like that, we were, you know, building these models based on, you wouldn't have guessed that the Motley Fool would be the best performer. But from 03 to now of that original group, I mean, it's, it's by far the best performer. And, you know, part of that we have to take with a grain of salt because it has been, you know, a growth dominated market. Um, from 03 to 07 wasn't at the beginning period, but from 07 to now. So the majority of the period was a growth dominated market. And so that, that definitely was a tailwind of the strategy, but you're, but you're right. It's, it's interesting that this, this has outperformed all the other ones we, we started with. One of the interesting things is, and we'll kind of talk about some of the criteria. I don't think we'll have time to go through every single one because there's a lot of different criteria in this model, but it's pretty rare for stocks to get 100% according to this model. And there's sort of two camps when it comes to running like these stock screen or mechanical investing strategies. On the, you know, Some firms run it like if the stock doesn't pass 100% of the strategy, then there's no way it could be held in the portfolio. Like for example, AAII, when they track their portfolios, the performance of their screens, if stocks don't make it in, uh, score 100%, pass all the criteria, they're not included. But the way we do it is different. And we do allow a portfolio to fill up even if stocks don't meet 100% of the criteria. So do you wanna kind of just talk to how we construct our portfolios that way? Yeah, well, as you alluded to, you know, the, a stock getting a hundred percent score on our Motley Fool model is is extremely rare. I mean, all, all, most of the time there are zero stocks getting hundred percent. And you know, I also think you may know this better than me, but I believe this is the strategy we run that has the most individual criteria. I mean, it's it's like fifteen or something like that, or eighteen, or you know, it's a lot of criteria. So it's it's more than any other model we run. But but to get to your point. When you follow these strategies, you know, one of the things we wanted to try to do was make them useful in the real world. And so a model that has such stringent criteria that it never passes anything is not useful in the real world because what am I going to, when it's not passing anything, what am I going to do? I mean, am I going to sit in cash until it recommends one stock and then I'm going to put my whole portfolio in one stock? You know, that doesn't make any sense. So what we wanted to do with all these models, knowing that all of them would have periods where they passed a lot of stocks and periods where they passed less, is we want to make them useful in the real world. And so what we figured we would do is in order to do that, we would take the top ranked stocks, you know, either 10 or 20, no matter how many stocks were currently passing the model. So if if there are no stocks passing 100%, well, we'll go down to the ones that pass 92%, and those will comprise the portfolio. Because what that does is that actually allows you to use the portfolio in the real world. Whereas, like like you talked about with other you know people that do it, if you run into this trap of well, when there are no stocks passing it, you know I can't be in cash. What am I going to buy? You know, buy an index fund or so it makes it much more difficult. And so that that's the decision we made is that we would we would set the amount of stocks in the portfolio and fix it, and then we would just rank all stocks using the model, and and the top 10 or 20 would always be in there. Yeah, and I do think this is probably the one strategy that has the most criteria, although maybe Dremen might be kind of close. And if you maybe peel back all the different individual like embedded criteria and the criteria of our Buffett model, you know, you might get there. But in terms of distinct, you know, profitability or momentum or accounting improvement type of metrics, I think the fool is um, probably the one with the most the most criteria. So um, let's sort of talk about the model a little bit. I mean, maybe at a high level, um, how would you go about defining just generally what type of stocks this model is trying to uncover? Yeah. So the first thing I like to do when I look at any model is say what factors are in play here, um, you know, of, of all the major investing factors. And so if I was to look at this from a factor perspective, I, I would end up with three. I would end up with momentum. Um, I would end up with growth and that I would end up with significant exposure to size. So this is this by definition, as we'll, we'll, you'll see when we get into the criteria, by definition, this is a small cap strategy. It, it has certain requirements that you know, only small cap stocks could potentially meet. So for an overall factor at an overall factor level, this is basically growth. This is momentum and this is size. On the momentum piece, so let's just get into that. So the, the, the criteria that probably gets at momentum the most is this relative strength measure. And this model requires, to pass this specific criteria, it requires companies to have a relative strength or 90 or better. What relative strength is, it's a relative measure of price performance relative to all other stocks in the market. So the higher the relative strength, 100 would be the best. So 100 would be like the best performing stock. Or the best performing few stocks, and then you go down. And so a 90 is pretty high. It's really uncovering stocks that have done very well over the past 12 months. Some of our models use other things like consistency and momentum and things like that, but this is just using a pure relative strength um, measure. And the one thing I would say from a 
observing this strategy over the years is that this, the fact that momentum is really being combi combined with a lot of other fundamental measures is um, something that more new strategies do, but, but originally back then there wasn't very many strategies that were using momentum, but the fool was, you know, incorporating it. And what I would say is it seems to do a good job of keeping the portfolio out of trouble. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, when a stock is rolling over and the momentum is declining, this, uh, portfolio or model will basically penalize that stock and, you know, move into something that's performing better. So even though momentum can be susceptible to crashes, I think when you couple the momentum with the fundamental criteria that maybe we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, it, it just, it's at least, you know, we, we have almost tw in two, 2023, we'll have 20 years of real time data running the model. And, you know, when I look back on an annualized basis, calendar year basis, at least, you know, the model's done a pretty good job of, of staying out of trouble and having really, really large decline, unlike some of our other strategies. Yeah, you know, there's sort of two ways to view momentum. You know, the pure momentum guys say, you know, it doesn't matter why the, why the stock's going up. It's just that it's going up. And, you know, that if you're going to take a pure momentum approach, which we have some strategies that do, that's what you're going to do. This is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. This says, I want to figure out that there's momentum, but I also want to figure out why the momentum's there. I also want to try to figure out, you know, whether the momentum is sustainable. And, and that's where we get into some of these other criteria. You know, we won't go into all of them in detail, but, you know, it wants to see a profit margin, for instance, above 7%. It wants to see sales and EPS growth that are higher than the same period last year. Um, so you have a lot of these criteria. You know, you want to see consistent profit margins over time. You, you have a lot of these criteria that look at what's going on in the underlying business and what's driving that momentum and, and try to, you know, to try to figure out whether that momentum is likely to continue in the future. One of the things that these guys I know talked about on the Consuelo Mac Wealth Track um, show was, you know, looking for stocks that have are led by like founders, like the fat, like Bezos, like with Am you know, Amazon or other company or Tesla with Elon Musk, you know, they're companies that are being led by their founders and you can't really get that. I mean, there's places that track that, but in terms of quantitatively looking at financial statements, you're not going to be able to back into that. But one of the other criteria that, that they look for is, you know, high insider holdings. So they want to see companies with at least 10% of the shares outstanding um, owned by insiders. So that shows that insiders are confident in the business. And that's one criteria that they look at. Yeah, that's right. You know, and insider ownership is an interesting, you know, depending on who you ask, you know, that, that either is, is a good factor or it's not a good factor. It's an, it's an interesting, you know, obviously in theory, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you want, you want companies where the insiders own a high percentage, but you know, there, there can be different reasons for that and different things going on behind the scenes. So sometimes it's, sometimes it's not as good maybe when you look at the actual results, but in, in this case, yeah, they, they want to see, you know, they not just want to, they don't just want to see momentum and see improving business. They also want to see insiders who, you know, who are betting on the company as well. Then they've got some just accounting stuff in here. They've got um, inventory to sales, so they don't want to see inventories rising, accounts receivable to sales. Um, if accounts receivable relative to sales are rising, that could be a red flag. There's uh, the debt to equity ratio, which a uh, long-term debt to equity ratio, which is that's across all of our strategies. I think we have looked at this that long-term debt to equity or debt to equity is one of the more common ratios used among a lot of the strategies we run, um, which is an interesting little thing. And uh, then they have the full ratio, Jack, which is the peg ratio. So maybe um, I'll let you explain what that is. But what, what I like about that is here we have a momentum strategy that's looking for growth stocks, but there's also this value component that comes in. So it does reward companies that are trading at reasonable levels relative to their growth using the peg. Yeah, they, they call it the full ratio, but, you know, Lynch, Lynch called it the peg and, you know, people, different people call it different things, but, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely not something new they came up with, but it is an interesting way to sort of look at valuation relative to growth. The peg is also interesting or, or the full ratio because it, it's something you'll see on a lot of websites, but there's so many different ways to do it that a lot of times you'll see conflicting information. So for instance, just take both components of it, the PE ratio. There are a lot of PE ratios. There's a trailing 12, 12 month PE ratio. There's a future PE ratio. There's an average PE ratio. There's a lot of PEs. And then there's also a lot of growth rates. Growth rates are even more complicated. You know, are you using a five-year growth rate or a three-year growth rate or a one-year growth rate or the, the growth rate that analysts, you know, estimate for the future? There's so many different ways to look at that. So it's something to keep in mind whenever you see something like a peg ratio on a site because they can be they can be very very different but in this case what they're looking for is 0.5 or less so trading at half the growth rate which is which is a very stringent criteria it's, it's very hard to find stocks that do that but when you do there there could be an opportunity with that and then you have um a few criteria that are really just trying to isolate or keep the best stocks the ones that would get the highest score from the small cap universe so they reward companies or the model rewards companies with sales less than 5 million. It also wants to see, you know, pretty 
low daily dollar volume of a security, which means that it's not, you know, necessarily highly traded among large institutions because their view on that is, you know, small companies are undiscovered. And if you can get, you know, smaller stocks with these fundamentals um, that are exhibiting momentum and growth, you know, there's a likelihood that those are going to be be the ones that go on to be mid caps and maybe large caps eventually where you can really get um, really great performance from. So, you know, we see this in the factor world too. I mean, this, this idea that, you know, factors, you know, factors have been shown to work better in smaller stocks as well. And so the whole idea that there's these undiscovered companies or less liquid companies or less followed companies or however you want to look at it, you know, this is sort of the same principle that we apply in the factor world, but uh, apply to their strategy, which is, you know, you, I have a better chance to find stocks that meet my criteria in smaller stocks than I do in larger stocks. And the Motley Fool just, they actually came out with a second edition of this book, I think two years ago, and they had updated it with um, some new information. So it's, you know, it's clearly something that they, they sort of look at the, these criteria and, you know, they find validity in them. I mean, they published another edition of this book, and I think they added to some of the, um, you know, some of the stuff that they were talking about in there. So like our purpose here is just to kind of walk through these strategies to give you some insight into what goes into them, maybe give you some ideas as to variables or ratios or metrics you can use in your own um, investing process. And uh, also, since we have, you know, quite a bit of performance history on it, I think it's interesting to look at strategies like this and understand periods maybe they did well, periods they didn't do well, um, and sort of what the return characteristics are. Obviously, you know, past performance is not indicative of future results, and that's pretty much the disclaimer that comes with every investment portfolio or fund, but um, it's interesting to look at and learn from nonetheless. Yeah, you know, like we said at the beginning, these are the last guys that you would expect to develop a quant strategy. You know, you know, based on their public reputation, you know, they're known for the exact opposite of that. But, you know, it is interesting that, you know, of all the stuff we've looked at, um, you know, th this particular strategy, you know, developed by people who aren't known as being quants has, and, you know, obviously it's only 18 years or whatever, 15 years or whatever we have data on. But it's just interesting that these guys are, who are not known as being quants have developed a strategy that, you know, for us outperformed anything else we were able to find. We'll put a link to the... Um model in the uh, show notes. So thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.